Kia ora and welcome to today's episode of the Disrupt Ed interviews and this um, today we have um, Mike Collings. So Mike Collings is, um, I think his title, we'll work it out if this is correct, is the principal of um, Te Kura, um, New Zealand and um, we're going to talk to him a little bit about what Te Kura, um, is doing and what it's doing differently now in lockdown and also some of the learning that um, Te Kura has done over the years in terms of connecting um, with students engaged in distance learning. So welcome Mike, how are you? Good, Claire, and thank you very much for having me. My pleasure, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the a little bit about the history of Takura and what Takura does and your role in the school? Okay, um, well, Takura started around about 1922, and it was originally just for you know remote students, and we only had a very few students. Over the years, it's changed. In fact. In that the proportion of remote students is quite small comparatively. So we are a state distance provider and um, over the year we have about 22,000 students enrolled with us. Um, like today we've got about 13,000 students on the roll so we do have a lot of churn in the, in the organisation and we have a, a real range of akonga. Um, many of you will be aware of the students that we have who are dual students that are you know, helping schools offer a broad curriculum or yeah. help schools um, adapt, adapt their curriculum. And um, if maybe, but the main focus of what we really um, are looking towards is how do we really engage well with the students who are our full-time students who for whom that Takura is the only school. And we have a large number of those and most of those have been students that have been disengaged from schooling um, prior to coming to us. And then we have a low, another group of students, which is about 5,000, who are students that have left school and they're, they're over 16 and they don't, they've don't. they decided not to go back to school and they enrol with us. Yeah. As well as that, we have a whole lot of adults who are wanting to get qualifications. We've got students living overseas who are New Zealanders. We've got students who live in the realm countries of New Zealand. And we've also got, you know, um, a lot of students who've got psychosocial or learning support needs. So we have a very wide range of students. Yeah. Um, and we kind of like, you know, uh, this sort of place for every kind of just different uh, scenario, if you like. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think often we um, get quite a simplistic view of what Takura does when we're looking at it from a school's perspective, because many of us will know you, as you said, for um, as a mechanism for offering sort of breadth of subjects or, yeah. or subjects for you know in languages in particular. I know it's popular at our school, yeah. um, but you know you do an incredible breadth of work. Um, so, what does it look like for Takura? For many people, they might think that it's business as usual for you going into lockdown, but there has actually been some changes, hasn't it? What does it look like? for Takura to go into a level four lockdown? Well, maybe if I just talk about the pedagogical approach that we take and so some of the things that, that are different for us. Um, so we we follow the, a, a pedagogical approach called Big Picture and I know, Claire, that you're very familiar with mm. that. So we're really trying to focus on a really strong personalised learning programme where students have a lot of um, agency and um, there's a lot of collaboration between students and between um Kayako and, and also with their whanos. Um, and so the whole kind of philosophy is about really focusing on one student at a time, but in a community of learners. So we have a, a whole range of ways in which we engage with students from um, asynchronous learning um, to synchronous learning to um, uh, group learning um, online. But also what's the biggest difference for us now is that we also have a lot of face-to-face -face learning with our students. Over time, we've realized that actually just learning at a distance, mm. um, it, it does need to be that sort of human contact. So we've, um, over the years, we've become a regionalized organization. So we used to be all located in Wellington. Now we have four main regions. And within those regions, we've got sub offices as well. And then over the country, we've got about 1500 locations where students come together um, once a week, maybe once a fortnight for, for um, a personal interaction with their, what we call learning advisors, or we've given a new name now, we call them kaimanaki. The, the whole idea is that the, the, the person that, that looks after this group of students is about, you know, enhancing their mana yeah. and giving them agency. So, um, and the kind of approach that we have too is involving students in real life, authentic learning experiences in the community. So most students would have either, 
you know, a, a, an opportunity to do job shadowing, to have informational interviews with um, employers, or um, actually involved in internships or be in a trades academy or, or those sorts of things. And that's been a big change for us over this, this particular time. Um, you know, really, we aren't able to go and do internships, for instance, and the whole trades academy mm. programs that we've been offering um, are not available for us. So um, the, the big thing that we've had to do, though, is because, because most of our students have not really engaged well with school, um, they, we have to really understand what really sparks them. Yeah. What is their interest and what are their passions, but also more importantly, what is their potential? What is it that they love doing and what is what they're really good at? And we're then focusing on trying to get them to be able to be the best at what they're good at, rather than spending a lot of time trying to fix up with what they're not good at. Because a lot of the time that's what's been happening for them. They have come to us often feeling as though they're not really very good at many things. So that's been a big game changer for us and, and the big picture approach to learning um, has really um, enabled that. But the biggest thing that's enabled us to do this is actually going online. Yeah. Because yeah. You, know, you weren't always an online provider, were you? Like I, I remember oh. being surprised a few years back um, when I was working alongside one of your, your teachers um, on the PPTA ICT thing around that there was a real element of paper-based learning still oh, yeah. happening at yeah. Takura. Yeah. So, so basically, our online off, our, as being an online organisation has really only happened over the last five or six years. Prior to that, we were just almost a completely print based. There have been some courses that we've had, some of the more well known ones, like our art courses, our, um, our, our um, visual art courses, have always been online for the last you know fifteen or so years. Yeah. And some of our music courses and those kind of things, but by and large, everything was print based. And so, if you can imagine. Um, the, you know, the teacher would order a booklet, it would be sent out to a student, it might take a week to get there, the student would then decide whether or not they wanted to do it or not. <laughs> More often than not, I think some of them didn't want to do it. It, was it became the kindling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then it would sent, be sent back and by the time that the teacher actually marked the work or looked at yeah. the work, um, the student had forgotten what they'd done, really, basically. So the, the big game changer for us is that, one, is that it's enabled us to be, that online learning has enabled us to really personalise learning right down to the, a very you know, modular level so that students don't have to do complete whole year-long courses. They can do a module of a course that's related yeah. to um, you know, what, it, what the authentic learning experiences might be. So our job often is really focused on that authentic learning experience and then to provide the academics that enable that student to be able to do that. Um, so now students um, enroll with us in a, in, a, in a module or a subject or whatever, and by that afternoon, they have got a course. Awesome. And yeah, then, so it's, it's in real time, yeah. Yeah, so, and then they, they, um, they do the work and they'll have conversations with their, their kayako and the, or their kaimanaki, they'll have um, email and conversations or they'll actually talk to other students about what their work is. That will be then, you know, submitted through, the, through a Dropbox and more often than not, the students saying, oh, miss, I put my, um, uh, my assignment in yesterday, have you marked it yet? <laughs> so the pressure's actually the other way around. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's what we, has been the other surprising thing. I've been ringing around teachers over the last few days and the engagement level of kids at the moment is huge and yeah. the teachers are really having to work quite hard to keep up with um, with what um, what the students are doing. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and I imagine your young people, there'd be a, um, like one of the things we've recognised that we want to do differently in school to support our students if they ever find themselves in this space again is a focus on learner agency. So you, your yeah. students must have had to have sort of developed learner agency anyway. So I guess that's serving them very well in this current context, isn't it? It is. I mean, when I, I mean, what I'm talking about is the idealised situation. Yeah, you know? we I all mean, are. You know, and when it works <laughs> well, this is what it looks like. Because there's a lot of kids that still say, oh, you know, I want you to tell me what to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I um, but you know, the, over the time, we, we one of our co-papa is fucka mana that the kids have their own mana, yeah, and that um, we also have a lot of focus on the kids' well-being as well. So we do well-being surveys with students frequently, just to to monitor whether or not they're where they're at, so we can notice which part of their actual holistic life, their kutahitanga, is not being actually focused on. So. Um, and then we want to really engage the parents with them as well, so the parents can actually support them in what they're doing, or their whānau, their extended whānau. So, so, so um, it feels a little bit like you've actually taken, because I love the big picture. We, we, we went and visited the Met School and we got to yeah. briefly meet Dennis Litke when we went um, on our tour to set up, and when we're doing research to set up for Hobson Ball Point Secondary yeah. School. And I, I fell in love with big picture, made, just seemed to make a whole lot of sense to me. But what yeah. I like is that you've taken the big picture ethos and I know that you're actually a registered um, big picture um, education um, yeah. centre, but you seem to have married it with a bit of a te ao Māori lens yeah. as well, by the sounds. Yeah, we wanted to, we, you know, um, we wanted to make sure that it was contextualised in, in New Zealand. And I, both Dennis and Elliot Washer, who's the founder of Big Picture, are mm. really happy with that. And I don't know if you know Jim McCutcheon, and Jim yes. McCutcheon and I are both on involved with Big Picture Australia as well. And we've also set up Big Picture New Zealand. Um, and um, and Dennis and, and Elliot Washer are both very keen that it's contextualised in the environment. It's not kind of like a formula that you actually follow. Yeah. It's got some basic principles, which is really just strongly personalising learning making um, learning relevant in the, in the real world. I mean, the three the three R's for big picture are relationships, relevance, and rigor. Yeah. And um, that's a kind of a different approach. Um, yeah, and so in, in a distance sense, the online environment has really enabled us to actually do this in a much more effective way. Mm. I mean, it's, the, the, you know, sending out things and waiting for the mail, and actually, at the, in the current environment, you know, New Zealand Post struggles to get the mail yes. to the students. So, you know, um, we have very few students that are not working fully online. We have a few um, that are in locations that it's almost impossible to get. But we're talking really like forty or fifty students out of our entire school population. It's not many. No. And, and yeah. so what do you think have been the biggest learnings over the years in terms of your distance learning approach? You know, when I think about all of our teachers around New Zealand have been thrown in the well and truly in the deep end um, yeah. uh, 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 with um, suddenly becoming distance learning providers. Um, yeah. You know, what are some of the biggest learnings that you've gained and, and sort of tips and insights for our teachers who are at home sort of playing this game for the first time? Well, the first one was, you know, the, um, in, in improving teacher um, capability and uh, with, with te technology because, key, you know, yeah. in the print-based era, there wasn't a lot of technology apart from the phone and email that was required. So this has been quite an amazing learning curve for many of our teachers, but I have to say they've been amazing mm. in, the very, in, in a very quick space of time. You know, I mean, not very long ago, you know, Dropbox, that was an unfamiliar word you know, and um, designing courses for online, although we're quite lucky because we have a design team at Takura that designs and stuff. And I can talk a bit about some of the key elements of what makes the design work effectively. Yeah, definitely. But um, the other side of it was the students themselves and, and, and how they were going to be able to manage in this kind of environment. So we've had to set up a, a really good, strong help desk hub. And most of those people are quite young um, and they kind of relate to the students. They can understand what students are talking about. I mean, not all of them are young, but they, but they, yeah. they have a really good understanding of what, where the students might be coming from and what might be a problem for them. Um, so we, we also have got set up an arrangement where, you know, um, the, the hub, the, our help desk or the hub, we call it, can impersonate the student to actually help them on their computers. And really, if it's got to the point where the student's still having difficulty, we will just send somebody to their house yeah. to help them set up things. Because, you know, there's no point in having um, online learning if the kids actually can't even get their passwords sorted out. So, so you make sure all those barriers are removed yeah. in the first and, and, and the students usually should go. Not always do they do this. 
because a lot of kids just want to leap into whatever they want to do. But there is a lot of um, introductory materials for students to go through that help them understand how the system operates and to how to do a Dropbox and how to communicate and how to get onto Google Hangouts or UCU yeah. or all of those sorts of things, because those can be, you know, are really, really inhibitors for them. So yeah. we've had a very strong, a uh, lot of professional development over the last six years for teachers. And, you know, I have to say, I don't know that many people have a problem with them. I have to say, though, that our learning management system, which is called Brightspace, we don't use it to its full capacity. It's, a, it's got a lot more um, potential than what we're using it for, and we're learning new things every day about um, about about that. I think the didn't, didn't um, you use um, didn't you bring in D two L for a period, or did you well, have that? that, that that's it is based on that. Yeah, D two L is the company and the learning man. Well. We call it Maitukura, that's yeah. basically what it is, but it's actually a, a D2L product. So in terms of um, the designing of the courses to make them engaging, you know, we, we had some spectacular failures at the beginning. Um, and but our creators Important part of learning, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but our creative services people, um, they, they've got some sort of principles. One of them is the, the, the three Cs, they call it, that's got to be clear and, uh, clear and clean, concise and consistent those are the kind of things and then our manager of creative services is chris lawrence and he says what chris likes that's the fourth c <laughs> um or if chris is sick of it it gets changed <laughs> yeah um and then you know basically the the kiss strategy keep it simple um you know simplicity instead of complexity is the main thing mm. so in making sure that things are really um uh, accessible to students it's a really important thing to have a lot of white space on the on the, on the pages and so that does we have a limit to the number of i don't know how many characters but we have a limit to the number of characters per per screen yeah but on that screen there'll be drop down boxes so you know you the student can just drop down and get more detail behind things a lot of more visual things a lot of um uh, 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 uh videos youtube connections and also a lot of um, interactivity between other students through um chat boxes and all of that sort of stuff we do, we do also have quite a lot of face-to-face um, -face that we built into um, D2L or Maitakura is a thing called UCU, which is a collaborative tool where students come together with their kaimanaki and they can actually have conversations, do a lot of that kind of flip classroom stuff where yeah. they can, um, you know, have looked at some videos the night before or looked at their learning program and then they come in and discuss it and go into groups and that sort of thing. Um, the um, the landing page when students come has is, is been something we've had to really manage to make it look easy to navigate. And one of the things that our creative services talk about is actually having um, the principles of visual hierarchy. So, um, you know, these our, our people know you want the hierarchy, you want, you want the kids to be able to go to the the place that you want them to go to first. Yeah. Rather I think wayfinding online is really, really important, isn't it? And yeah. I think that's, that's been one of the biggest stumbling blocks um, yeah. with a lot of the tools that we're using is that kids get 101 notifications and knowing yeah. what is the most important thing to get engage with and what to engage with first is often lost. Yeah. So, you know, this, the thing is the size of the, the, size of the print this, the, is the first thing that takes all, or the colour. Mm. If, you want, if you want kids to go to um, a particular place first, you know, you want something that's a bright colour of some sort. Um, so that's what I'm sort of talking about, about visual hierarchy. And it often is more effective and if there's not too much dense print there that it's actually got graphics or it's got pictures or it's got videos to, to attract people's attention. Um, the simple, it's simplest, got to be simple. Yeah. And the other thing is that we've focused on is it's got to be mobile first so that it's got to work on a mobile phone. Um, not that most of our kids work on mobile phones, but in the end, that's what we know that everybody has a mobile yeah, phone. Yeah, it's your baseline. You, you can guarantee baseline. that everyone has at least that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's good about D2L, um, Bright Spaces, because um, it's adaptive. It will adapt yeah. itself to um, iPad, to um, iPhone, and also to um, uh, tablets and that sort of stuff. Um, so you, you're working, you're going to work with the ministry for us, eh, to make sure this rolls out to everyone. Can you just talk that, Mike? <laughs> just like that. <laughs> um, we, we, we're, in, we're, in, we're in conversations with the ministry at the moment. Um, so 
just just actually for your information, we've we've let some schools into our system, so Porirua oh. College and yeah. um, um, Mana yeah. College are just having a look at it and, and trialing it and having. Oh, now, I feel, now I feel like you're teasing us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, we've we've what we've done so far. I can let you know this. Um, we've we've copied over to a new instance that's separate from Takura that the Ministry of Education will be managing. Uh, we've copied over 102 full NCEA courses. Wow. So that's NCEA level one, two, and three. And each of those would have probably about you know, 20 odd modules in each of those programs. Yeah. So they, and then the ministry will be trialing that just in terms of how um, how student, how teachers get onto it and how, how students get actually enrolled into the system because yeah. it'll, it's separate from Takura. So we can't have them in our instance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, as we speak, we, we are um, um, pulling over as well all of our years seven to ten um, programs, and um, they, they're all all over. And we've also got um, years um, one to six going over today, and we've got some early childhood programs as yeah. well. Oh, that's so, exciting! Because I think, and, and you've touched on one of the things that's a real challenge for a lot of educators at the moment around the NCA space. Um, um, I've, I've set up this NCA hackathon space on Facebook, and we've got heaps of teachers that are really interested to collaborate to look at how they can develop online um, NCA tasks, but also how they can design integrated NCA tasks. Yeah. And that must be one thing that you've done. I mean, I know that you one of the areas that I find our teachers are really struggling is getting their head around the traditionally more practical subjects. Um, and Takura's had a long history of doing, um, you know, what would traditionally be deemed practical subjects through digital yeah. spaces, haven't you? Yeah, well, I think one of the biggest excitements we've had is actually um, doing um, music videos online. Mm. So last year we had a 50 kids collaborating to actually come up with a theme for a song, um, do the lyrics for the song, all have goes at um, uh, putting the uh, music to it, yeah. then um, putting the vocals to it, then doing the dancing, uh, and then doing the video videography as well. Um, that's been pretty amazing. Uh, and I'll show off here, we've won two awards for that particular oh, wow. video. So um, cool opportunity to show how you can do online, but also integrate and connect with across the curriculum as well. Well, in that case, the kids were getting English credits, they were getting um, technology credits, they were getting dance credits, music credits. Is that, is that example captured anywhere that we could share? Yeah, with it's called, um, it's on YouTube, it's called Echoes yeah. of the Sun. Echoes of the Sun. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hunt that down and I'll attach that to this interview, but I'll yeah. share it in the NCA hackathon page as well, because it'll be a really neat example of doing things differently. And also the fact that it's group work as well is really exciting. Yeah. Some some of the other kind of, I mean, we've got lots of examples, but we we haven't set up specific integrated program necessarily because the students themselves set up their own integrated yeah. program based on, so I can give you an example, it's called, we call it Sam's Garden. And this boy actually was actually living in Australia, in New Zealand, living in Australia. And he was having difficulty engaging with anything, but he actually liked growing things. And so he used to grow a variety, you know, I mean, some kids do some amazing things we don't even know about. So he was growing six different kinds of organic potatoes. And when, if you got him on the conversation with this, you know, he'd just absolutely get totally um, carried away with it. So uh, we managed to, you know, entice him to enroll in horticulture. Yeah. So that he'd do some modules on horticulture, but then he used to go off and market them at um, one of the farmers' markets. So he built himself a stall, and that involved him doing a whole lot of technology, um, hard materials, and that sort of stuff. Um, he used to record himself telling the story about his organic potatoes, <laughs> and so <laughs> um, he made lots of um, signs and stuff. And he's got media studies. He he also was marketing stuff marketing is weird so you know the all of these just came with his kaimanaki they were able to plan out a kind of a thing that and he ended up getting all his credits wow. on, for yeah. nca level one yeah based on sam's garden that's awesome <laughs> yeah. that, that, that warms the cockles of my heart and that's the real power of um letting the students take the lead eh? and actually yeah. wrapping like i've often argued that our job is actually to notice the opportunities um, for capturing and curating evidence and 
in, in a sense, let them indulge in what they're passionate yeah. about. And, and it's our job to backfill and wrap around and, and capture the opportunities for learning. Yeah. Excellent. Just but just be warned, Mike. I've decided that I'm going to be you when I grow up. Okay. So just <laughs> when you're when you're ready to retire, to let me know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I get so excited talking about this stuff. I think it's magic, yeah. and I I think that's one thing I'm really hoping that we get out of all of this is that we see glimmers of these opportunities in the current context, because I think we're starting to see teachers be more responsive and creative yeah. and um, starting to see where are the opportunities in their homes and their context um, for them to do the learning and how could we um, wrap the learning around that. I just hope we, we hold on to that yeah. when we go back into anything that's like um, normal again. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't know that we're going to go back to the same normal, are we? Everybody's no. saying that. Yeah. No, not 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 any time soon. And I really hope we never go back to the old normal. I think there's some really neat lessons to be learned in the the space, just in the pace and the way that we're living at the moment. Yeah. I think there's some huge things. I mean, I know it's not for everybody, but what we've found is that, like, one is that we don't we're not did, we're not reliant on bricks and mortar for um, how we deliver things. Yeah. Even even though that we do have face to face, we we manage to hire places all around New Zealand just for the times that we need it. So, um, you know, we've got so pop up learning spaces. That's exactly right. And so, mm. if we don't have the student population there, we just move it to somewhere else. We don't need yeah. to. So, our population doesn't always stay in the same place. Just we, we can't predict where all the students are going to be like. We, we know generally there's going to be lots in Auckland, but we don't know which region of Auckland. So, we, we set up at these what we call advisory spaces and areas that we've got a density of. A density of population mm. and then that changes it can change annually and and those advisory spaces because they're not about the physical spaces are they they're about the relationships that you can develop by having yeah. the face-to-face -face. so can you tell us a little bit about what made you decide to adopt and adapt the big picture because i imagine that relationship in the physical advisory was a big part of it how did that come yeah. to be well actually you know um i went to the met <laughs> Like you. Oh yeah, and you have a moment. We go. Um, ah! <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, I had a kind of a bit of a sabbatical. The board mm. gave me some time to go and have a look at you know new innovations, and I'd read Dennis Blickey's book, and um, I it was co and was coinciding with me going um, that there was a Big Bang conference on at the Met. Yeah. So uh, it was at actually at, at um, Brown University. And so I went there and all of a sudden I could see that the things that I'd been thinking about, these people had a practical way of doing it. Yeah. Um, I, I couldn't, in, in my mind, I couldn't think about how the hell you can do this. How can you personalise learning to that, that, that extreme? On that scale, yeah. On that scale, yeah. So, I mean, big pictures usually small by design, so we've had to try and make ourselves small, if you know what I mean. So the... the the regionalization and the, and the sub regionalization, and then the going right down to the individual advisory. Yeah. Um, has, has, that's the way that we've managed to get to the kind of the size that actually um, enables students to interact effectively together. And then, um, you know, we had a group of people at Takura that were pretty passionate about that. And it took a long time for it to catch on. But, you know, I'd say there's nobody in Takura now that doesn't actually passionately believe about big picture as being the way to go. And yeah. our board, we've had a fantastic board who totally back this approach to learning. And I suppose the other thing, um, Claire, is, you know, our results are still not absolutely fabulous. No. But they were pretty not fabulous before. <laughs> Yeah, and I think as well, that whole focus on results, the reality is we're dealing with human beings with, yeah. you know, 101 different personal stories. And, I mean, the moment that you're getting 100% amazing results, I actually don't think it's telling the truth anyway. No. Exactly. Because it's not, a re it's not a reflection of the the sheer, you know, variety of human experience that we're working with. Yeah. You know. And, you know, for, for us, we've had to think really, I've, I've really come – to be, have a lot of empathy with the with some of the um, experiences that our stu students have had in their own community. I mean, a lot of our students do have um, have suffered a lot of bullying, not yeah. just from uh, just in the community generally. 
and um, Takura and at our, at our advisories has become a safe haven for them and it's enabled them to be able to learn. Um, yeah. Other kids, they just, they had, they'd, they'd had negative experiences and they couldn't get themselves out of that negative space. So enabling them to come to Takura, at least sometimes for a bit of respite. Yeah. And, and many of them do actually go back to a school. No, not some go back to a school, but many often go on to other you know, tertiary educational or vocational learning. And, and that, the respite thing's really interesting because in, um, a, a repeated conversation I've had with teachers from my school and from other schools is that um, the glimmers of re-engagement of learners who were disengaged in the classroom that actually going to, you know, there's a lot of people that are worried about kids becoming disengaged by going remote and being yeah. back in their homes and they're worried about their home situation. But the flip side is there's stories upon stories of kids who were disengaged, quiet, didn't speak up in class, suddenly okay in this space yeah. where they can message and, you know, in the yeah. online environment and are actually re-engaging. And, and the the bonus that I've heard, you know, there's a lot of kids saying, yeah, I miss the social side of school. I miss that physical interaction with mates. But actually the level of agency that they have and the yeah. ownership of how they manage their day and their time, because, you know, we know teenagers don't necessarily want to get out of bed at 8.30, 9 o'clock, no, yeah. 9.30. Um, tell us a little bit about what learning looks like for the students during the day. Is it a mixture of asynchronous and synchronous? Or nearly so, all asynchronous. A lot of it's actually um, based on what the students themselves. There's no kind of compulsion to do things. Yeah. There's no. Um, one of the things that probably we're trying to get in is to have a, at least have some time frames that the students set. At the moment, they they set time frames, but there's no kind of um, sanctions if you don't. Because of course, you've not got kids going through courses at the same time, have you? They're all no. going, you know, for the most part, dipping, coming in at different times. Yeah, we've got students enrolling every single day. Yeah. And we've got students coming off every single day. So when they finish their program, I just give you an example. Like we had summer school, we had nearly two thousand kids doing summer school. They were, they weren't our students. They were students that didn't quite make it. Yeah. So so they all came on when they realised, oh hell, I haven't actually got. Um, you might have a few more of these this summer. You know that, eh? You're bracing I, yourself. You might have a few more this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. Um, the. Um, and it's, it's been good because we've actually got other teachers coming in who are actually in a regular school, but over the summer have come in to us yeah. and they've learned how our systems work. And so um, that's that's been really good as well. And, and when if, if they've actually got dual students at their schools, they, they know a lot more about how to support them in their schools yeah. as well. So the, um, a, a student, if they were fully involved with big picture learning, and we call it our intensive big picture program, would be going to a face-to-face -face advisory. We call them huinga ako, um, three times a week, sometimes more. Yeah. And on the other two days, they would be going on their internships. They won't be at the advisories all day. They might. They. It's voluntary to come to a, a, a huinga ako. So they could go there and engage in their remote learning if they wanted to as well. They can. Yeah. But uh, but at the um, at the huinga ako, they would usually start off with a check-in time around about ten o'clock. Um, kids would, you know, sort of do, do a bit of um, uh, some activities that are, are, are grouped together. They may talk about what they're um, what they're planning to do for the day. Um, they m may also have had decided they wanted to organise an excursion of some sort to go somewhere. So that could happen on the on the day. But a lot of the time is actually spent um, with the with the kaimanaki, helping them, um, guiding them through their work. Um, Helping them locate uh, appropriate internships yeah. or job shadowing or that sort of stuff. We try to get the kids to take their own agency as well with that. We we ask them to cold call, but often secretly we've already rung up the person to see if they'll <laughs> to warm it up. So it's a lukewarm <laughs> call rather than a cold call. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, you know, there's some amazing internships that we we've, we've got a young man that's getting his pilot's license. Yeah. Um, it, we but we've had kids in dock. We've had kids in schools. We've had kids in um, going to the high court. We've had kids in accountancy firms kids um, in early childhood centres, florist shops, symphony orchestra. You just, but you're describing what I think all our schools should be. I'm <laughs> sorry. I think, <laughs> I mean, that's a crazy thing. I mean, that, that would, that's my dream in terms of how, what our school is for students. Yeah. It's that hub. 
that they can come into and they can get, you know, um, elements of some direct instruction and direct yeah. support and wraparound care. Um, but also it's, it's, it's drop in, drop out. Like I've, I've long believed that our walls of our classrooms and our high schools particularly need to be permeable and they yeah. need to be able to move in and out of that space. Yeah. Um, oh, man, well, you're speaking we're, 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 we're lucky though, Claire, is that we have the critical mass and the yeah. economies of scale. So when I said, you know, we put over 102 NCA courses at level one, two, and three, that's not that's not our whole offering because there were some things we couldn't put across. Yeah. We had, we had third party um, copyright involved, with, which we couldn't do. But in actual fact, of tens of learning objects we've got on our system, we've got over 26,000 learning objects. Yeah. And that, um, having that smart learning system pays off in the long run, doesn't it? Because you can... Yeah, it does, but, the, yeah. but we, we, we're now overlaying over it called a learning objects repository so that we, we can search the whole system. Because at the moment, you, the teacher or the kaimanaki or, or even the, the, the supervisor at a dual school needs to know what's actually in our system to be able to find the right thing. And so, you know, that's a pretty big ask for teachers. So the learning objects yeah. repository, which we've got, is called a quila which is actually interoperable with um, Desire to Learn. And we're just f finalizing that. And so once that's searchable, you know, you'll be able to go in there and you've got a student that inter is interested in legal, the legal system or whatever, and you'll be able to find a whole lot of things that would actually support them in their, in whatever they're doing in their internship. Okay, I'm, I've been, I'm rethinking my, my career trajectory now. It's not coming to take over your job, it's us joining together and taking over yeah. the whole system. <laughs> what do you reckon? You up for it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think um, I think yeah. That's the um, the thing that um, that Dennis Lickey and and Elliot talk about is leaving to learn. Yeah, yeah. So powerful. You know, the idea that we hold all the you know, and I've often thought of that about that with our kids in their homes as well. It's not just leaving us to go into the workplace. It's actually going into the community and into the yeah. home. And and you know, sometimes I think schools and Educators, we need to get over ourselves a little bit in terms yeah. of we can be a bit precious about, yeah. um, you know, yep, we've got incredible value and I think um, we are the backbone of community in many, many ways. Mm. But at the same time, there's, you know, whether it's through iwi, community, business, you know, whatever, there's so many opportunities that make a whole lot of more sense to be done yeah. in context, yeah. you know, rather than well, us trying to do an artificial story. construct about a, a young man who came to us from school and he was in his last year, he was a year 13 and he was a, a great musician and he wanted to do an internship at the symphony orchestra. Well, that's when he wasn't going to be that easy, but we went and talked to the symphony orchestra and, and talked about what possibilities it might be for him. So um, they are, they got him to do audience surveys on their, uh, their sort of string quartet. And so he had to set up a whole lot of, you know, um, audience surveys and then he had to write them up then he had to do all the analysis and then he had to report to the board but in the end he became the, the page turner for the first violinist um you know i mean like that's what these is the remarkable things that some of these kids can do yeah incredible in terms of helping us with the online environment we've set up this thing called my quarterway which is basically the, the sort of place where the students go to to sort of develop their learning um learning plans so um, when they first come into it, they go to the, the, the first part of it is it just, they go in and they talk about themselves, what are their interests, what are their passions, have they got any ideas about you know, what, what television they like or what sports they enjoy. Um, some kids can't really tell you that, you have to give them lots of prompts or give them some ideas about, about that. And also how important culture is to them. What, yeah. what's, what, what's their cultural um, identity and how important that is to them. And then, um, what 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 they know about how they learn, and then they do a well well being survey, so we can get an idea of how what they're feeling about themselves, and then they um then from that with their kaimanaki they develop um, a learning journey, and this is all uh, this is all on an, on, on an online tool, and most of it yeah. they can do it, do it by themselves, and in the learning journey it's got you know th these are my dreams and my passions and so on. Um, this is the kind of thing that I've uh, and this is my learning plan, basically, and um, setting up their learning goals. And then 
the other thing that's, that's significant for big picture is your reflections on that and your exhi exhibiting of your stuff. So the kids that are in the intensive big picture program, they have termly exhibitions of their work where they, they prepare a presentation and they yeah. can invite people to come to it. They often just invite their friends or, or they might not want their friends. They usually invite their whānau and they would invite their kaimanaki or maybe any of the other kaioko that they've got. And they do an exhibition and, you know, the first one's usually pretty mediocre. But over the years, you know, I've seen some kids go from just, you know, doing one minute and then, you know, being so embarrassed and, and nervous to in, ending up giving a whole session on coding to a group yeah. of yeah. I so, mean, what an incredible skill set to develop in terms of, you know, where they're moving out beyond beyond school. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Okay, I, I have a feeling I better wrap up before I keep going and going <laughs> and telling the whole of New Zealand that I'm doing a takeover with you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, Mike. That's just been bang on and it's just such awesome awesome to hear this story I mean I sort of I feel like I knew the surface level like I knew you guys were doing big picture and yeah. I I knew that you had these hubs um, and advisories that I, I really like the sound of but it's just been magic to hear some of the detail and some of the stories behind that but I think as well I think you underestimate the power of some of the stories you've told about Sam's garden and the echoes of sunshine yeah. and and those sorts of things and the things that we can pick up and learn and the fact that we might you know be able to also have a little bit more access to some of your resources um, um, yeah. as well through the Ministry of Education. So, hey, thank you so much for um, giving us your time today. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate it. We'll be sharing this tomorrow. And um, I just want to say a huge thank you again for the work that you're doing and, and the time that you've given today. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Bye. -bye.